ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Josh Zelanes, Senior Analyst, Forrester. Good morning. I was trying to figure out how I was going to start this conversation today. And I thought I'd just cut to the chase. I love you. Now, the best part about this is in May 2000, you might have gotten an email with the subject line. The swirling feeling in your stomach is you're receiving an email from a friend, an associate, a coworker, a former lover. This lore was so effective that 10% of the internet at the time clicked and executed a VB script to then go and send the same email to all of their contacts. And I thought this was a good story to start the discussion today, because almost 20 years later, majority of organizations still can't prevent this type of attack. Office macros are an extremely popular lore because they're effective. They just work. So popular, in fact, that a third of the phishing campaigns in the last three months leveraged malicious office macros, according to Checkpoint. But really, where I want to start driving the conversation today is to, to get everybody thinking about the generations of threat. There's a lot of talk about Gen 5 today, a little bit about Gen 6. But I want to make sure that we all have a solid background on the importance of the generational threat model, as I've been <laughs> calling it. And that this is really a maturity model. See, the important thing is that the generational threat model, it, it allows you to understand the tactics and, and technology and communicate threat. It's the language to communicate threat to your colleagues and to your executives and your board. So I have no way of seeing everybody out there. So maybe a little applause or something. How many of you are comfortable with the generational threat model and use it internally at your organizations? We have a, a, a contingent over here. What is Gen 6 really, and how do we protect ourselves? So like anything, let's start from the beginning. Floppy disks. Back in the day, we had to copy files between computers. We still do, but it was a much more manual process when you had to put something on a floppy disk and carry it over to your buddy's computer to go and give them a copy of whatever software you were pirating at the time, let's be honest. And the thing is, is that at, at this point in time, information didn't travel very quickly. So viruses didn't evolve quickly either. And what happened is we got to a point where we could start looking at these viruses. These, as they popped up, we'd identify them, say, oh, this is bad. We'd calculate a cryptographic hash and keep a record of it and say, if you ever see this again, do not. And then we started plugging our computers in more and more frequently. All of a sudden, we opened up delivery methods for these attackers, these adversaries to do things like we saw with SQL Slammer, 2003. Now, this is a traditional Gen 2 threat here, and that it exploited a network vulnerability to propagate. Now, of course, this is all bad, largely why we don't throw our databases directly on the war zone. But the response that we had was to start reducing our attack surface, and we leveraged firewall technology in order to do that. Now, of course, the one problem with firewalls is you got to poke holes in it. So this brings us back to Lovebug. Lovebug was successful because it relied on two things. Business critical service, email. You're not going to shut that off. And social engineering. Again, the, the beauty behind that attack was that it leveraged your contact list to distribute and send additional emails. The people who received these thought it was legitimate because it was coming from someone they knew. And they were either curious or excited when they got it. Apparently 10% of the population that online was at the time at least. So because we can't block delivery mechanisms, all of them, 
you know, things like IIS and email started getting targeted more and more. And so we needed to figure out what are we going to do about these holes in the firewall, and it led to traffic analysis. This is your IPS, your WAF. And so as we finally get control of our environments, things changed dramatically. Adversaries started building evasion into their toolkits. Signature-based malware detection was no longer an effective control. One of my favorite data points about this comes from the 2016 Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report. 99% of malware hashes were only seen for 58 seconds or less. The problem there is you cannot find a file. Ask yourself, is this malicious? Go do something to figure out if you're going to make an indictment and then distribute that information before that 58 seconds is up. And so it led to two new paradigms in how we perform detection. The first is behavioral analysis, behavioral detection, and you see that in sandboxes and endpoint detection and response. You also see it in static analysis and leveraging machine learning in order to find files that statistically look like something that we've seen that's bad and do indictments based on that. Now, of course, that's not the end of the story. Like any good business person, and let's be honest, all cyber criminals are business people. They needed to find a way to scale. And that's really the core of what Gen 5 is about. If you think about things like Shamoon and the impact that it had on Saudi Aramco, it's been described as wildfires blowing through their infrastructure, overriding boot sectors, and just destroying things wholesale. In fact, 75% of their workstations were lost in this attack. But one of the things that I think is very interesting about this is that their network segmentation acted as fire doors. Their ICS system survived. Their HR system survived. Their financial system survived. Segmentation is key. And if you think about it, even going back to Gen 2 before we were using firewalls, you know, that really is the first level of segmentation, if you will. And attacks like WannaCry would also be contained by segmentation. In fact, that's why uh, it needed a, a secondary delivery mechanism, because you just don't have SMB open on the war zone. So now we've talked about the evolution of attack through five generations. But my promise was to give you six. Now I've heard lots of people say that the Internet of Things is Gen 6. And I don't disagree whatsoever. But I think that, I suspect that a lot of people are wrong about why. You see, with cryptojacking, we've already seen the value of compute. With Mirai, we saw a global distributed denial of service attack that was on a scale that nobody had ever seen before. And according to projections, the number of IP-connected devices in the next five years is supposed to either double or triple. IoT devices are there for the taking. But I'd argue that as we look at it from this context, what we're really seeing is that the scale is getting bigger. It's still Gen 5. It's just a lot more Gen 5. But the interesting thing is that as we go across these generations, sometimes we get a hint. Sometimes we see something early. The Morris worm, a multi-vector attack that included a buffer overflow in the finger service. Gen 3 capabilities in 1988. It's 12 years before Gen 3 hit maturity. Shamoon, Gen 5, 2012, five years before Gen 5 hit maturity. So what have we already seen that can hold a clue for what to expect? Stuxnet. Stuxnet was a worm that targeted specific Siemens PLCs with the intent of doing physical damages or physical damage to the centrifuges in the Natanz nuclear enrichment complex. 
degrade, deny, disrupt, and destroy. Imagine if we started targeting the commercial sector in a manner that attacked their very ability to produce. What if we go after these IoT devices with the intent of destruction? So you have to order new robotics and Toyota can't continue making cars. What does your supply chain look like to recover from something like that? This, I argue, is our dystopian future. So how do we defend ourselves when we ha haven't innovated a solution to Gen 6 yet? So I'm going to start by looking at the technologies we already have in place. We have signature-based malware detection, which is largely ineffective at this point. It's been replaced by the behavioral analysis and AI. The initial attack surface reduction that we saw with firewalls has evolved into next-gen firewalls that also do the traffic inspection. And we've seen over and over the effectiveness of network segmentation. So the truth of our failure is that we're always trying to solve the latest problem. And we can't even keep up with our own innovation. Gil was talking earlier about how we average generation 2.8 level of defense. We don't need new technology to save us from Gen 6. We need a new strategy. We need to apply the technology that we have that we are leveraging effectively. 2.8 is basically three here next-gen firewalls, segment your networks, and reduce the loss and stop the spread of wildfire. With that, I want to thank you all very much. <laughs>